Hello and welcome to another Sagely Health webinar. Um, I am Jeremy, the CTO of Sagely Health, and I am joined as always with Dr. Sager. Jason, how are you today? Doing great, Jeremy. Really excited to be here, ready to talk about triple negative breast cancer. Yeah, yeah, me too. So our last webinar was on clinical trials for pancreatic cancer, and we had a lot of questions come in, as we did for today. Uh, it was kind of like it really hit a nerve with some people in the sense that they really kind of were unlocking some information and had a lot of follow up with people. So we wanted to kind of go deep on um, kind of one group of breast cancer because it's such a wide cancer. So today we are focusing on metastatic triple negative breast cancer. Um, so let's to begin, Jason, I know that a lot of the people who are listening right now and who have submitted questions are obviously very aware of what triple negative breast cancer is, but we do have a lot of people watch these videos afterwards, and some of them might be coming at it from a different place. So could you just talk a little bit about what we mean by triple negative when you talk about breast cancer? Absolutely. And again, you know, we could talk about first, you know, breast cancer is such a varied cancer. Um, you know, we, we talk about these cancers as sort of, you know, buckets of, you know, lung cancer and breast cancer and pancreatic cancer. But we know now, now know that underlying these cancers are lots of different proteins and other changes in a cell that enables it to become cancer, basically to stop, you know, listening to the body and, you know, doing what it's supposed to do in the body and just start multiplying and growing somewhat, you know, unstoppably. And that's cancer. And what we know now is that there's various things that drive that. And so in breast cancer, again, we've sort of subgrouped these and uh, subtyped them as, as based on estrogen, which is, you know, and estrogen receptors, which is the part that receives. So normal breasts are sensitive and as they should be to estrogens. Those can some of those cancers will maintain that sensitivity and express those estrogen receptors. So that would be estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. That's not what we're talking about today. So in the in triple negative breast cancer, those cells have lost that receptor because again, just decided it wasn't needed or whatever, and, and it's you know, that's mutated or whatever, so you know, so it's no longer utilized. Another avenue that we subgroup um, breast cancer by is by something called HER2. Uh, which is which is a another receptor, which again stimulates growth, much like the estrogen receptor does in cancer cells. And again, you know, there's a whole group of breast cancers that are based on HER2 positive or amplified, and and they have special treatments like Herceptin uh, or in HER2. Uh, those are also not the ones that we're talking about today, because in triple negative, you've basically lost both the hormonal receptors as well as the HER2 receptor. And so really what we're talking about in triple is estrogen, progesterone, which is sort of the cousin of estrogen, and HER2. All of those being negative, this cancer cell basically is growing for other reasons. And we'll talk about why that is one of the reasons it's so important to get tumor sequencing done when there's a triple negative situation because we want to know what is driving that tumor to grow and tumor sequencing that we review separately through next gen sequencing is a way of figuring out why that cancer is growing and if there's anything in the body that may be uh, enabling it and we'll talk about BRCA in that setting as well. Okay, so I just want to make sure that I understand and kind of can summarize. So if you were diagnosed with breast cancer, you have a tumor in the breast, you will be given tests to see if you are ER positive, PR positive, and those are related to estrogen and, and hormones, and then if you are HER2 positive or not. And if all of those, and th those represent ways that a patient would be treated. They say, oh, if you are PR positive, then we're going to go this way or, or that. So, so any of the options that those would unlock, you don't have. And so, so then when, say, someone's triple negative, it's just kind of the triple is that we've discovered three different things which are great indicators for treatment methods and uh, right. approaches. So the other part of the, the population of, of patients that we're talking about is also, you know, triple negative, but they're also metastatic. So I just give a really brief, you know, I think everyone probably understands what that is, but if you give a brief thing and how that might relate to breast cancer. Yeah. 
Yeah. And and actually, it's something we, we should talk about because I, I you know seeing some of the questions is not all aligned to, to truly metastatic. Metastatic being defined as the breast cancer is in a place that is far away from the breast. Right? It has traveled to a different organ, whether that is the lung, the liver, the brain, the bone. It can go to multiple places in the body. Metastatic is also sometimes used, although again, uh, you know, somewhat, you know, th there's very variability here in terms of whether it's traveled to a lymph node. And you could say that lymph node represents a metastatic state. On, on, on reports, we see this all the time. And yet, for breast cancer and some other cancers, but especially breast cancer, it's tr lymph node spread is treated very differently. I don't call those situations truly metastatic, which is the same as sort of when it's in the bone or the brain or, or the lung. I call that regional. And so you'll see variations in description. And this becomes very confusing to patients. So what we try to do is to help patients navigate to understand what is their risk, what is their treatment options, and what's the chance of this coming back, and really trying to minimize that through therapy, but as well as some diagnostics like that next-gen sequencing that can give us a strategy for treating it uh, in order to prevent it from coming back or to treat it so that it doesn't come back. So let's get into treatment because their focus today is clinical trials and taking some questions from folks. And so let's first talk about what the standard treatment is. If someone is a metastatic, a triple negative breast cancer, what, what are they likely to be offered by, say, a community oncologist? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. And so, you know, the, the, for truly metastatic disease, which is spread to other organs, there are you know, a variety of things that can be used. But in general, you know, those standard chemotherapies, and we'll review some of them in a few minutes, have limitations in terms of how well they're going to work. Unfortunately, we're still living in a situation today where surgery is really the best option for patients whenever they can get it in order to create a cure for cancer. Right. That being said, there are, again, avenues to pursue that are, you know, standard, and that is mostly a lot of the chemotherapy. And, you know, again, there's a number of them that are used that we'll review in a little bit, but more so innovative approaches. And so from my perspective, it's important not only to just go and get the treatment that's being offered today, but in truly metastatic disease, where really the, the goal becomes not necessarily a cure, but becomes really keeping this tumor without growth for as long as possible to create basically a situation where you're living with cancer, but yet it's under control, it's maintained. And whenever it starts to get out of control, you've got something else to do. So the strategy becomes to put multiple options in front of patients that can be sequenced. And that's what we do at Sagely Health. And you know, we'll show some examples today of how folks can look at clinicaltrials.gov or other and, and ask their doctors and advocates for help in coming up with those strategies. Great. So let me get into some of the questions that we got, and then I think we'll kind of step through a lot of the, the things that we're talking about. So <clears throat> the, the first question I have is, is from a woman in uh, New York City. She is 31 years old, and she was just recently diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer. Uh, her surgeon and oncologists are recommending 24 weeks of chemo and immunotherapy before surgery. So I'm, I'm guessing that she's not quite metastatic in, in, in the way that you're talking about. But her question about getting these 24 weeks of chemo and immunotherapy, is this common? Should she do this before she has the surgery? And then she does add that the tumor is 1.4 centimeters. Yeah. So um, what would you advise um, this woman? Yeah. And again, you know, we love to hear as much information as possible. Sometimes we happen to hear sort of all the tidbits in like a, a, a small summary like that, that really helps us to dive right in. So we'll go through some of the things that we don't know about the situation, but what the patients told us isn't actually enough to actually tell them the answer, which is very cool. And, and so, you know, and, and a great question because many patients that we speak to, I mean, all of us, I just said a few minutes ago that 
surgery is the only way to guarantee a cure. So then why wouldn't I just go right for surgery? I need surgery, right? And like, it would be logical to think this, and most people do. So the idea that, hey, we're gonna actually prep the surgery with a few weeks of, of treatment, okay. But like 20, what, 24 weeks? That seems really, really long. Like, what, what, what are you doing? And so I agree with the question. And to find the answers, we've got to look at how sort of the understanding of knowledge about this treatment has evolved. And let me, let me go ahead and show you a little bit uh, of that today. So I'm going to share my screen here. And you should be seeing a map, but I'm actually going to switch. So, so you know, scientists um, in the you know, it, you know, uh, uh, as we go along, you know, clinical trials are done, and those clinical trials basically end with publications. And you know, as, as an example, you know, this is a publication that we're going to be talking about in a little bit uh, with pembrolizumab immunotherapy in early. And early, by the way, fits into that regional and, and lymph node metastatic state, triple negative breast cancer. And so going back, this one was published quite recently, but going back, actually, there's another trial that I actually looked at to, that shows um, really how, how patients are doing in terms of that question of do patients do better with adjuvant therapy, which is after surgery, or neoadjuvant therapy, which or preoperative therapy, as the case may be. Now, this data I have to warn you is it's complex, and you know, it's not shown in a way that is easily digestible, which is why it takes expertise to take a look at this stuff. But the bottom line is the the answer is right here in front of us, and if you look at this line here, this is the situation where. And again, this is a trial with hundreds of patients, um, and they've been sectioned into those three categories that we had been talking about previously. Um, and here, the ER negative and PR negative, this is the triple negative group. All of these patients, I believe, are also HER2 negative. Here, we're looking at a ratio. How much better is it to get the chemo before than after? And the answer is right here. It's about twofold. It's about two times better to get it before than after. Okay. You know, and at the same time, you know, we can say, look at this data. And again, there are organizations then that say, ah, okay, based on this data and other data, we put this together and synthesize recommendations. That group is called the NCCN and they produce standard sort of guidances for physicians. They have a patient section. I actually looked at it. It doesn't have as much detail as it does for physicians. But in the physician's copy, and I'm showing it here on my screen, you could see now sort of a summary of all of the information that talks about the known benefits of preoperative systemic therapy for, you know, and, and specifically talks about triple negative breast cancer. That's abbreviated TNBC. And you could see here that, that one of the, that, First of all, it can facilitate preoperative chemotherapy or systemic therapy. We'll talk about what the recipe is. It facilitates breast conservation. So for patients who are looking for minimal breast surgery afterwards, this is a great step. Many patients don't particularly care. They're going for their double mastectomy and fine. But there's other advantages as well. Uh, mo very importantly, it can render inoperable tumors operable. That's a very important point for a lot of patients who are in that gray zone. It's not in lots of different organs, and yet there's hesitation from a surgeon. And by the way, this is an advantage to see a surgeon as well as a medical oncologist when you first get diagnosed because it's together that they can kind of come up with the best strategy to treat you. Another third point is that you know, tr the treatment response in triple negative, because we don't have a lot of those tools that we talked about earlier, being hormonal blockade or the HER2 uh, agents like Herceptin, we don't have those for triple negative breast. 
So being able to see how the tumor does and how it responds to the systemic therapy is really important early on. And the fact is, on, on, the, on the next page, I'll, I'll skip to this, uh, a pathological complete response, which is a complete disappearance of the tumor, which is not, not uh, which quite a few patients will have, is actually the best possible prognostic indicator, basically future telling finding, that says that this tumor is not going to come back. And so knowing that is quite important. Again, we'll get into some of the others. Uh, you know, here is the allow time for genetic testing. And yes, all triple negative breast cancer patients should have genetic testing, both on their tumor as well as on their body. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But again, there's a lot of different possible, you know, wins. There's some, you know, cautions, right? You know, you have over treatment. You could have under treatment. Uh, it could progress during the time. But generally speaking, Again, the study that I showed earlier shows that patients generally benefit about twofold as much with the preoperative than the postoperative, and that's really important. Wow. Okay. So what I'd say there is I don't know that we can tell you whether or not it's a common thing, but we can definitely tell you there is kind of medical reasoning behind it, uh, like strong reasoning. So, you know, given someone's situation, they can be evaluated, but yes. And, and, and I, and I want to underline the couple points that you said, like, so one is the involvement of a surgeon and a radiation oncologist, um, and a medical oncologist right away. And, and cause if a surgeon tells you, I can do this or I can't do this, get others' opinions, get the involved, because these sorts of things can get unlocked in those conversations, because these things, they can get missed, because cause not everything, you're asking if, the person's asking if it's common, and the, the fact is, is no, we don't know. Different approaches are being taken in different places, even by the same oncologist. So you want, you want to be vocal about knowing these type of options are available to you. Yeah, and again, the information is changing quickly, and it's really hard for doctors, especially a surgeon, who's hopefully operating like almost every day of the week, I mean, yeah. that's who you want your surgeon to be. How much time do they have to read up on how pembrolizumab is doing in, you know, stage 2B triple negative breast cancer? Not much. And so, you know, that's where we all have to help each other out. And that's why, why it's important for patients to seek advocates, to seek this information, and to bring it to their doctor, ask questions, but also see multiple doctors specifically the surgeon, the medical oncologist, and the radiation oncologist. And let me actually, while we're on the topic, answer part B of the question, which is, um, you know, is, is this is this regimen the right regimen? And, um, you know, what, what I was, and I'll wait a second for it to come back up here, what I had seen, again, in, um, you know, a place like the NCCN, they will go and they will take a look at this. And so let me just see here the, I believe it's, it is. Hold on just one sec. The doses are on page 65. There we go. All right. So, you know, looking at this, and I'm going to take you over and zoom in on the right side here. Uh, is exactly the situation that this patient is describing. And we'll, you know, so again, you know, this is for patients, which I found in NCC and uh, in another place, is for patients who have T1C or T2. And we'll talk about what the staging is and how that represents tumor size, as well as whether or not the lymph nodes are negative or slightly positive, so an N0 or N1. We don't know whether or not what the lymph node status is in this patient's situation. The patient may or may not know, but we know that the tumor is 1.4 centimeters. And what we know is that stage T1C is actually greater than one centimeter and less than two centimeters. So this patient fits squarely into this recommendation. And here's the recommendation. It's preoperative pembrolizumab, which is an immunotherapy, plus chemotherapy, and that includes paclitaxel and carboplatinum. And then it's followed by adjuvant chem uh, pembrolizumab after the surgery. And we'll talk about other agents as well. 
because there are agents that can help. Um, but they're not the estrogens in the in the HER2 blockers. So, so you know, how many, what's the right cadence? Well, this, you know, and what's, you know, is 24 weeks the right number? Well, you know, this is a regimen that's given every 21 days, which is three weeks for four cycles. Well, three times four is 12. It's followed by another similar regimen with different agents given every three weeks for another four cycles, 12 weeks. Well, 12 plus 12, 24. It matches exactly what that patient heard. And from my perspective, it's really helpful for patients to know that what they're hearing matches the standard recommendation. I think it's actually quite important. Now, what that doctor hasn't told the patient about, but we can, is that after the surgery, there's likely to be more. But this is only one agent. It's just the pembrolizumab. And pembrolizumab is quite well tolerated in most patients. And so this is going to go on for every three, three weeks for nine cycles. Nine times three is 27. But again, you know, if, if the patient didn't have this before, they'd certainly be having this afterwards. And so really they're getting the, the bulk of the treatment up front and then really quite light treatment afterwards. And I think that that's also helpful to share. So you know, I'll stop there, but you know, the answer to that you know, the patient is yes, I believe that it is wise to get it preoperatively and that they're getting exactly what is the standard recommendation. And so, you know, kind of go forward and, um, and, and you know, we, you know the, the, the end result is how well will that patient do? And again, for that, go back to the literature and go back to this study. Um, And the fact, and one of the, let me just, oh, I think it's, yes, I pulled it up here. And the fact is that this is, this has just been published. So this is from, I think just a few months ago, I think it was uh, uh, February of 2022. Um, and what it showed is that patients who do this, this exact treatment in the situation that this patient is, um, is is telling us about, they have an 84.5% chance, 80, almost 85% chance of this tumor not coming back compared to the old style, which would have been the chemotherapy still previous. And those patients have a 76 or 77% chance of it not coming back. I mean, 77% is not bad, but why not go for the 85%? And so this is how science happens. And again, this hasn't been, this data is fairly new. This data started coming out in 2020, but has been updated every year and it's still continuing to emerge. The story is still being told. And it's really important for patients to know um, that the very latest. And again, you know, that's where we get involved. And, you know, you could see over time that pembrolizumab, these are, this is the success rate for patients. So higher is better. And yeah. you can see that, you know, these patients separate out from the other patients. I, I want to be one of those patients, you know, if I have this situation. And that's how we approach it. Excellent. Wow. So, I mean, so bringing it back to clinical trials, which I think we, I can very easily tie, which is pembrolizumab came through clinical trials, just as all standard therapies do. And so kind of looking at in trials, pembrolizumab is used and being used in different ways in, in different combinations. Um, so let's jump over to the next gen sequencing because um, that leads into a couple of questions. Um, so, you know, we've covered that before, but just to kind of remind people, there's genetic testing where you might give a blood sample or a swab of your cheek, and there we're able to kind of tell what's in what they call the germline, what's in all the cells of your body. And with the next gen tumor sequencing, it's actually a piece of the tumor material analyzed for the mutations that are actually happening in that tumor. So I, I want to bring up a question that someone brought to us, and i got to lead you wherever, but the, their doctor is telling them there's no clinical trials available to them. They had tumor sequencing done, but the oncologist tells me it didn't reveal anything. This person is just wondering, are there clinical trials they should be considering? And, and so I kind of say, well, let's talk a little bit about what's going on. I mean, we always recommend the tumor sequencing get done. In this case, we say, hey, I don't know if this led to anything. So I, I wonder if you could kind of address that. Yeah, absolutely. And again, it's it's a really good question. As I mentioned, 
And I think as most patients with triple negative breast cancer realize, because they don't have the estrogen receptor, they're not going to be able to take tamoxifen or other you know, or aromatase inhibitors like fulvestrin for a long time after getting this tumor removed as a post-operative adjuvant therapy. And right. again, when you do have it, tamoxifen will be given for five to 10 years. And so, you know, you know, that is quite nice for patients to have that knowledge of, of that triple negative breast cancer doesn't have it. Similarly, it doesn't have the HER2 agents. And therefore, again, it really becomes very important for patients to get that tumor sequencing that we talked about. We recommend it. NCCN recommends it. They actually also, for all a triple negative breast cancer patients, they believe it's important to not only get the tumor analyzed with that next-gen sequencing, but to also get the baseline, that sort of genomic or you know, germline uh, assessment done. Because we want to find out if those patients have BRCA1 or BRCA2 specifically, as well as other genes that may cause or stimulate cancer. Uh, first of all, it could be very important to helping family members know what their risk is. But secondly, one of the maintenance therapies for triple negative breast cancer can be a PARP inhibitor. Those are specifically acting, are targeted agents that specifically act against that BRCA gene mutation. And therefore, if a patient's found to have that, even if it's only 10 or you know, so percentage, they can use this medicine to, again, prevent recurrence. And so we talk about you know, that sort of preventative adjuvant after the surgery treatment. But for patients who don't have it, or again, you know, look around, you know, want to do a clinical trial, they're in a truly metastatic situation. And again, fortunately, we have quite a number of patients who come to us in that situation. Oftentimes, they'll hear that statement that their doctor doesn't have, you know, that there's no clinical trials for them. And I just wanted to show you um, in preparation for today, I did a quick search. To, and, and again, we built a, a system that helps us to see this. But again, I'll show you how we can do something similar on, on clinicaltrials.gov later. But the fact is that, you know, again, we built this to guide patients and there are clinical trials. So I'm just going to share my screen again and flip to that. So here is a situation that that patient said. Uh, not looking at any genes that are mutated, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit in a moment, because, but, you know, looking here, there are, you know, no less than, I think, about 400 trials that are across the United States. And, you know, these numbers are actually the numbers of centers that have these trials, but you can see here that there's lots of opportunity. So, Yes, there may be a patient in a location where they might need to travel a bit to get to one of these trials. But the fact is that I would say that, you know, in almost nearly every place in America, a trial is available. So then the question becomes, well, why did the doctor say that no trial was available? And for in that perspective, what we've we've seen commonly is, again, there's no tool for doctors to do this, and they don't have the time. They're quite busy. They don't have the time to do this kind of research. It's hard. So what they do is they look at, well, do I have any trials to offer this patient? And if the answer is no, they'll say there's no trials available. There are no trials at that center with that doctor. Some of these centers are quite large, like, and, and again, they're wonderful centers. But you know, they may not even know that there's a different place, uh, office, doctor, clinic, who's offering a trial that that patient will fit on. They, they will certainly almost never know that there's a, another institution or cancer center nearby or at a distance that's offering a trial for that patient. And therefore, that's where we like to get involved and help patients to understand what's out there for them to consider and then to bring those ideas to the doctor and say, well, what do you think about these options? And frequently we'll hear, wow, I didn't know that was going on or, wow, you know, like, oh, you should definitely take a look into that or it's reasonable to consider. And that's when we know that, you know, th there's a win in hand. And, and again, our, our objective is to create the best possible outcome for patients. So we're always aligned for the patient to do best. 
Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, I want to be conscious of time. I think we can go a little bit over, but I want to rush through two questions really quickly because I think we got to answer them. There was one, someone asking about immunotherapy trials uh, for triple negative breast cancer in New England. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think we can just tell them pretty quickly from that map you were just showing, very, very likely there are. I mean, they, they may not be exactly in your neighborhood, uh, depending on where you are in the Northeast, but there's definitely things that will be going on for triple negative breast cancer. Um, Jason, yeah. is there anything you want to show on yeah. that? Yeah, and I'm sharing my screen now. You know, I did a search, a, a sub-search of this, and actually there's 68 therapies, right? And here I'm assuming that this patient, again, we don't hear the details, but I'm making the assumption that they probably received immunotherapy before, probably that pembrolizumab has already been given. And therefore, what trials exist? Well, there's still lots of trials. Again, this is in the Northeast area, New England area alone. There's things like TCR therapy, and we talk about that in another webinar. That's really an exciting immunotherapy that's coming down the pike. There are you know, other antibodies or bispecific antibodies in combination where we're trying to really see if we can tweak the immune system to do even better. Um, you know, there are other newer therapies. This is one for an intratumoral uh, compound that is targeting uh, something called TLR9. And that is another activating for the system, for the immune system. And so there are, you know, again, this patient's looking for immunotherapies. And so all of these will be related. But when we take a look at the map, you can You're see welcome. it's peppered up and down the eastern seaboard. So I don't know where that patient lives. Uh, when we when we do know where the patient lives, we're able to tell them very quickly how far and where to go. But um, but you could see that you know by, you know most likely the patient is going to have an option available. Wow, great! Well, and to that patient, I mean, feel free to follow up, and I, I'll follow up with them as well. We'll get more detail to them. Um, you know, this might be a good time to kind of plug. We do have a feature that we'll share with everyone over email that is. We're allowing people to ask questions very similar to what we're doing in the webinar, but between the webinar for whatever whatever cancer type. And so we are able to kind of, this is how we're able to give pretty in-depth responses because we built tools that allow us to do that pretty quickly. So um, I, this was a great, great question. I think we can answer it pretty quickly, but there was this is from a patient who is going to MD Anderson to see if they're eligible for clinical trials in MD Anderson. Um, they're being treated somewhere else. They love where they're being treated, but they're so worried. They, they, they ask, you know, uh, will they make you redo your scans, your tests, your biopsies? I can't imagine going through that again. So could we yeah. answer that? Yeah, for and, I, and I, I love this question because, yeah. yeah, it's completely logical. Like here I am, you know, wherever I am, Colorado, California, I'm going to MD Anderson. And it's a great place, right? And, and so you know, are they going to redo all these things? And the answer is they try hard not to. And, and so they're going to get the medical records. And sometimes these things are hard because, you know, there's, there, there's other departments involved. It's best when patients actually ask for the medical records to be sent ahead of time, but also bring a copy with them, either electronically or physically when they go. The same thing for scans. You know, yes, they'll send them, but a lot of times these things get misplaced. They don't arrive. They don't get checked beforehand. Patients bring a disc with them, and we have instructions on our website on sort of how to get you know the disc and bring it with you to your doctor, and so you know do that. Um, and then, but then you know, the biopsy is a great question, and most of the time, again, that that original biopsy can be shared. Now, sometimes a clinical trial will specifically require a patient get a new biopsy, and or at least be acknowledged to be whether they're willing to or not. And so this is something that will need to be revisited on a case-by-case -case basis. I don't want to make it sound like there's never a time that some of these things are redone. There is sometimes a very good reason that they're redone. And again, a patient needs to weigh whether or not getting in, you know, a new innovative therapy is worth getting the biopsy again. It's a personal decision, and there's no right answer. But in general, you know, again, we, they, MD Anderson and every cancer center does its best to try to get as much information as possible from what's done already. 
Yeah, and just because we're talking about biopsies, I want to point out something. So when a biopsy is taken, and the, the, the pathology department that is trying to diagnose will take what they need of that material, and the rest of that material is stored. So it, it's it, then since it's stored usually at the medical center you're at, if you want to get next-gen sequencing done for that tumor at any time, you can check to see. Sometimes there's issues. Sometimes you need another sample. Sometimes there's not enough material. But most of the time, there is still material left that can be done. So it doesn't, if you didn't get next-gen sequencing, sequencing done at the time of diagnosis and their pathology report, no worries. Just ask your doctor to look for where the sample is. Yep. It should exist. That's right. Okay. So our last question is a good one, but I want to say I, I stole this off of Reddit. There's a great breast cancer subreddit, very active, a great place for people to kind of get information. Um, it was just kind of too good to not kind of address today. So this was someone with triple negative breast cancer. And you, addre you addressed some of this earlier, but for other, she points, uh, for other types of breast cancer, doctors provide medications to help recurrence decreases. You talked about some of those medications. Do triple negative breast cancer patients have no medication post-active treatment to help them lower recurrence? Um, is this why recurrence is generally higher for triple negative? Um, and then, you know, she asked a little bit about why uh, Keytruda uh, is helping with this. And then, but then she also, this is also a good part, is do patients have to get, um, do patients have to get tested a PET, a scan more frequently after treatments. What's the average rate of recurrence, and is it a, is it a, is there treatment available afterwards? So yeah, there's yeah. a lot there, but yeah. I, I know there, there's a lot there, and, and again, we've covered a lot of it already. So let's just refresh a bit. You know, the answer to the questioner is in part correct about the the agents to be used after surgery to maintain the situation the tumor doesn't come back again different from a metastatic, truly metastatic situation where there you're trying to keep a known tumor from growth over an extended period of time. Here, there's a chance, and, and actually we saw from the pembrolizumab data I just showed a few minutes ago, 85% chance that it's not coming back, which is fantastic, right? And, and, you know, and the concern is mainly the fact that, yes, we have fewer tools compared to the ER positive and HER2 positive situations. It doesn't mean that we have no tools. And so you'll see the pembrolizumab being given afterwards. Uh, we talked about the PARP inhibitor. One that we didn't talk about is a low dose of chemotherapy that's given for about nine cycles called capecitabine. And so, and that's another part that I, uh, that was in the NCCN. Um, and then, but then beyond that, there's innovative therapies being tried to do better. And so again, with tumor sequencing, just looking at, 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 um, at clinicaltrials.gov, we advise patients to take a look to see if there's a clinical trial that is trying to do better in that maintenance phase, you know, when the cancer is not there to prevent it from coming back. Again, the chances in, again, the patients that we showed before, which are still early cancer, is, is quite good. As you get into the stage 2A, 2B, 2C, you know, and, and so on, it does decrease, you know, the chance of the, our efficacy decreases, our chances of the cancer coming back goes up. And so the question of, of monitoring becomes very important. And it's important that patients know what the standard is, but also that patients get what they think is the best thing for them. And I'll, I'll tell you where for me, it was a bit of a learning lesson as, as we've been doing this because we've had patients come to us with this very question. Right. And when you look at NCCN, the recommendation and what we hear oncologists saying, the recommendation is a yearly mammogram. Now, mammograms were great for detecting the cancer when it first appeared, but after surgery and oftentimes you know, reconstruction, of the breast, which is, is a great thing to have at the time of surgery, if it's possible. What's the utility of mammograms uh, on a yearly basis? And it's very small. Um, oftentimes when the cancer comes back, it's going to be metastatic. Now, I don't want to scare people. Mammograms is better than nothing. I definitely advise getting the mammogram once a year, but I would like to do more than that. And so you know, looking and uh, let me share here uh, a very recent article that um, that I found uh, in preparation of today, um, where you know people are are in alignment with that. So um, you know, here is a study of um, 
of pet of, of pet ct scan fdg pet so this looks at glucose utilization by the tumor it's a standard imaging assessment now it's not commonly available it's, it's kind of a specialty thing but in cancer it can be really helpful for some cancers and in breast cancer the question is well how helpful can it be and again looking at the information that's out there we know and i'm going to zoom in here on you know uh, several studies that looked at this well how sensitive is it at picking up metastatic disease well 93 percent sensitive well, that, that sounds quite high or 85 percent or 89 percent so it seems like it's quite sensitive now there are, there are a few issues with the specific specificity meaning if you do see something is it definitely cancer well not all the time but a biopsy will help you to tell that um you know there may be some false lesions in the in the bone um, there could be other other issues like, you know, here they suspected the recurrence. And so maybe that's altering this sort of sensitivity. But, you know, the newest study is here. And again, it is published in the new you know, in um, in the seminars for nuclear medicine. And, you know, I just thought that this was quite interesting. The statement here, which is that in patients with recurrent breast cancer, PET CT is more effective than conventional imaging in detecting local regional, that's that metastatic to lymph node situation, or distant recurrence, whether suspected by clinical examination, conventional imaging, or elevation of a tumor marker. PET-CT is effective even in the presence of basically those things being normal. It's a powerful imaging modality for performing a whole body workup of a known recurrence and determining whether or not the recurrence is isolated. Now, that's slightly different than the question that we were being asked, which is that, well, should we do this as sort of a routine? The fact is this, this doctor and others can't ask that question because no one's looking at that right now. From my perspective, with data like this, it's quite easy and logical to say, yes, it makes a lot of sense for patients who are at high risk. Which patients? Well, we know that, you know, at, you know, for, for stage one, it's not helpful, you know, because the chance of it coming back is so low, it's really just not going to be particularly helpful. Stage 2A, somewhat debatable. Stage 2B or higher, definitely. And so from my perspective, you know, how do, you know, patients need to be proactive and advocate. You know, what we've guided patients to do is to say, well, get that mammogram once a year, and then see if you can get the doctor to do the FDG PET once a year for the first few years, maybe alternating every six months. And that way you've got an exam every six months. And over the first few years, you've got a few PET CT scans that have a high chance of detecting if something metastatic is coming back. Again, that is not standard today, but it is logical. And I think it resonates with a lot of patients come to us with and think on their own, and we agree. Yeah, I mean, determination of when a scan is done is, is, there's a lot going on there. There's when the oncologist is willing to order it, there is when the insurance company will pay for it, in what cadence. Um, so if you are a really proactive person, and we like proactive patients, is you, there are trials that are trying to find out what is going to, to serve patients better um, and so that's something where you can definitely consider it there are a lot of trials for diagnostics in these situations so that's something we kind of help people connect yeah with. it's not something your doctor is probably going to put top of the line for you if they even know about it so so it's, it's something where you will have to be proactive and and clinicaltrials.gov is available it can be very hard to search that's kind of why we do what we do to make that um an easier easier thing um but yeah, um, this has been great. Jason, is there anything else you want to add before we, we tie it up here? No, I would just, again, invite folks uh, who have triple negative breast cancer or any other cancer patient, for that matter, to come and ask questions of us uh, through you know, the, the, the links that you provide or just come to our website and ask the question there. Um, we're here and we're here to help patients. So, um, you know, uh, I look forward to doing more. Yeah, and I would just add, if anyone has questions or topics they want to see in future webinars, please let me know, as you have in the past. And, uh, yeah, 
Well, thank you very much for the time, Jason. I'm glad we spent the extra 15 minutes. I think a lot came out of it. So, All right. Great day, and we'll talk to you soon. Take care. Take care, everybody.